An example. Neither Father, Miron, or myself can celebrate the Eucharist by ourselves. We cannot do it. I know, yes, there have been priests in our church in the past who have tried. <laughs> uh, if they ever found out that they should refund the stipend for doing that, they wouldn't have done it. But the teaching and the tradition of Byzantine Christianity is that the Eucharist cannot be celebrated by a priest alone. Can't be done. You know, I can stand there and say the exact same words that I say with the community behind me over <coughs> bread and wine, but without the community behind me, they would stay bread and wine. I need your permission to celebrate the Eucharist. Now, Roman Catholic Church has a different tradition in that, and I would let some Roman Catholic priests try to explain that. <laughs> no, I am not here to do that, and I'm not here to criticize their tradition or their custom. Okay? But I'm telling you ours is. Our real tradition, I can't do it. In fact, if I turned towards the congregation and said, let us lift up our hearts, and you said nothing in response, the liturgy's done, finished. Nothing can happen. I need your permission to go on. Because even I as a priest am not an individual. <clears throat> I am a person. Okay? And a person means that one has to be in community with others. I cannot do this alone. Now, you take this from the earliest customs of the church, the earliest traditions, the scripture, the early church. You see how different it is from the focus on the individual? that we have in our society today. And this, under, and this belief that Christianity can be churchless. Now, I have a number of friends of mine who are ex-Catholics who now go and think very wonderfully of themselves and going to non-denominational <coughs> churches. And I keep telling them, there is no such thing. <coughs> There's no such thing as non-denominational Christianity. And there's no such thing as a non-denominational church. There might be a building that you call a church where a group of people get together to do some whatever non-denominational people do. <laughs> um, but there is no such thing. Because it cannot be church. It cannot be church, no matter what they call it. Because the focus in much of American Christianity today is on the, uh, simply on the individual and not on the community. There's only one thing you do as an individual. And guess what that is? What? Die. Sin. 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 <laughs> Sin. Sin. Sin and dying are tied together. <laughs> that you do as an individual. It doesn't just affect you as an individual, though. But that's what you do as an individual. And when you repent of that individual act of sinfulness, <coughs> what does that do? It returns you to the community. It returns you to the church. Okay, which is the hospital for sinners, by the way. <laughs> it is not the antechamber to heaven filled with the self-righteous. It is the hospital for sinners. <coughs> Repentant sinners, but sinners nonetheless. And so, the early church is not focused at all on individualism, <coughs> or on our own uniqueness, or on what we think is our own personal pathway to God. No, it doesn't concern itself with any of that. So the church is focused on the person entering into the community of believers. And that community of believers is focused on the person of Jesus Christ in the Holy Trinity. That means the community, this church, becomes the means, indeed it becomes the mystery, of the real encounter of believers with the Trinity 
or as we like to say it in theological terms, with God the Father, through the, His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? It comes right out of the Bible. And there's a reason why it's in our liturgy. So from the day of the church, a spirit-empowered birth in Pentecost, it has been the purpose of the church to bring about that communion on earth. And so it's not ultimately anchored in one time or another. The Apostolic Church and the Church in 2012 is the same church. It holds that unity together throughout all of its development. It is the same church. But it continually experiences the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so it continues to move through time, although it is ultimately timeless. And what is the purpose of the whole church? What is its continual experience? What's its purpose? What's the purpose of the church? Ultimately. What? Well, you want a bunch of disembodied souls floating in there? <laughs> I know what you mean, though. The ultimate destiny and the ultimate purpose of the church is that you and I and all of us enter into full and total union with God. Okay? Second Peter tells us, become what? Partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. And so the church is ultimately the communion with the Holy Trinity. So it's both human and divine. It's human in us and our call to cooperate with the divine to which we are called to enter into union with. See, now this sets Christianity, and particularly Eastern Christianity, completely different than, for example, Islam. Okay? Islam is an individual journey towards an individual God. You know, that's what it is. The joke about Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. There is no church in Islam. You know, there's, you don't get received into, the, into a community in Islam. What you have is if you say that uh, very brief um, statement of faith three times before three other believers in Islam, you become part of the world of Islam. But you don't enter basically into a community. It is an individual relationship. And interestingly enough, the relationship in Islam is not the relationship between a father and his children. God is not father in Islam. God is master. And we are dogs. We are slaves. But what does Christ call us? Brothers, sisters, friends. So it's a completely different experience. And similar things can be said about other major religions, with the exception of Judaism. Judaism has some of those same understandings, but in that case it's a people almost like an ethnicity, although in reality it's not an ethnicity. But, um, but we are called to be part of a community. We don't enter into this alone, and that's what the church is called to be. And so, again, the constant call for the church is to lead us into unity with God in the end times. So what's the word for union with God? Have you heard this before? Theosis. Theosis. We are called to be in union with God. And what's the eschaton? The end times. 
Okay, so it starts here, and everything we do has this eternal dimension to it. There is not a single act of the church that does not relate to the eschaton, does not relate to the end. None of the holy mysteries of the church, none of the sacraments, are set in their time. Because the church is not set in its time. The church is always looking towards union in the end. And so the church is this community, we're going to keep emphasizing this, centered on ultimate communion in the Holy Trinity. And therefore she's made up of human beings, that are united to one another. But the interesting thing is that this is not a unity based primarily upon human social interaction. Therefore, ultimately, it has no ethnic basis. It has no racial basis. It has no uh, basis in uh, class, or, you know, financial class or what have you. It has it is not based on that. Now, of course, I would be a fool to tell you that there's not some influence of, of these human interactions. But that's not her primary basis. She's primarily centered upon and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And the thing is, is that if the church, if she, is not centered upon that focus and that empowerment, if she is centered on anything else, she will be unable to live out the Great Commission of Jesus Christ. Now, what's the Great Commission of Jesus Christ? When I use that term, what does that mean? That's right. So there, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the close of the age. And that's in Matthew chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. No church can survive if it becomes self-centered and does not proclaim the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And I'll even go further than that. No church should survive if it is self-centered and does not proclaim the gospel message of Jesus Christ. It shouldn't survive. It does God no good. And it does no good to the people who are a part of it. Because that's what we have to be all ultimately about. Now, some, for some folks, that's a shocking thing to say. You know, because they think of the church as an institution, and if I belong to this institution, and if I do what this institution says, that's all I need to do. It's like saying, if I'm standing in my garage, I will ultimately become a car. <laughs> but that's not what happens, is it? No, because the church is not primarily an institution. It has institutional aspects of it because it's a human as well as the divine creation, and therefore it needs institutional parts and guidelines and so on, but it is not primarily an institution. It is called upon to proclaim the gospel message. Now when we look at the scriptures, we continue to look at the scriptures, what's the early church centered around? What happens in the early church every single Lord's Day? The Eucharist, that is correct. That's not the Eucharist to the exclusion of everything else, but it is centered upon the Eucharist. 